Welcome to the first of two webinars on the Signatera test for ctDNA and molecular residual disease in early stage colorectal cancer, entitled, Knowing Early Can Make a Difference, Transforming the Management of Cancer with Personalized Testing. Notice of our second webinar, where we will present an in-depth discussion on the Signatera test and management of checkpoint inhibitors will be coming soon. This webinar is sponsored with an educational grant from Natera and is intended for the information of healthcare professionals in Canada in conjunction with the launch of the test in Canada by Life Labs. My name is Barry Stein, and I'm the president and CEO of Colorectal Cancer Canada. I'm also a survivor of metastatic colon cancer, having been diagnosed in 1995 as an early age onset patient. And I'm pleased to be moderating this webinar, and I know that you will find it extremely interesting. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of information that I know you will find of great interest. It's a great pleasure to have with us today three distinguished speakers. Dr. Adam Jurdy, who is a medical oncologist and medical director of oncology at Natera. Prior to joining Natera, Dr. Jurdy was the medical director at Austin Cancer Center and SUNY Upstate Medical University Cancer Center, as well as being a staff oncologist at Syracuse to BAMC. Dr. Hagen Kennecke is a medical oncologist and the medical director of gastrointestinal oncology at Providence Cancer Institute in Portland, Oregon. In addition, he is the current chair of the United States National Cancer Institute Rectal Anal Cancer Task Force and the SWOG Rectal Anal Cancer Subcommittee. Previously, he served as chair of the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, Rectal Cancer Disease Group. And Dr. Jonathan Lore is a medical oncologist at BC Cancer in Vancouver, BC. He is also an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia and co-chair of the BC Cancer Gastrointestinal Cancers Outcomes Unit and the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, Colon Cancer Disease Group. Today, Dr. Jurdy will discuss the important information about Signatera test, including what the test is comprised of and how it works, what validation studies have been done to date, and how the test can best be applied to monitor early stage colorectal cancer patients by testing for molecular residual disease. Dr. Kennecke and Lori will discuss individual case studies and provide their perspectives as medical oncologists treating colorectal cancer patients, both in the US and Canada. Following their presentations, there will be an opportunity for our speakers to respond to any questions that you may have. If there is insufficient time to answer your questions, our speakers will be pleased to respond to your questions in the days following the webinar. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Jurdy. Thank you, Barry. It's uh, really exciting uh, for me to be here today along with Dr. Skenecki and Lori, uh, just uh, to share um, the latest data on ctDNA. And it's really a very important juncture in cancer care in general, but uh, especially in diagnostics. Uh, next slide. So to put things in perspective, if we think about uh, the evolution of uh, the technology and how we diagno diagnose and monitor cancer from uh, the introduction of X-ray machines in the late 1800s to ultrasound in the mid 50s, then in the 70s, we had the introduction of CT scans and MRIs. And really the most recent uh, giant leap in cancer diagnostic was when PET, uh, PET-CT came into play uh, in year 2000. And we believe ctDNA is gonna be this next exponential jump uh, in how we monitor and diagnose cancer. Next slide. So going back to the basics, what is ctDNA? Well, we know that all cancer cells, or all cells, I should say, uh, cancer or normal cells, they are uh, constantly uh, turning over. Old cells are dying off, new cells are uh, being born. And in that cellular turnover, when the uh, cells break up, they release fragments of their DNA into the blood. Now, when it comes from any type of cell, we call it cell-free DNA. When that portion of cell-free DNA is specifically coming from the cancer cells, we call it circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA for short. Uh, so if we are able to detect that ctDNA portion out of the larger haystack, which is the cell-free DNA, then we're able to 
uh, tell in real time what the cancer is doing in the body. And that's really a function of the half-life of uh, ctDNA, where it's about an hour or less. So unlike CT scans, where it might take weeks or months to see the regression of the tumor or resolution of the tumor, here we are able to tell in more or less real time what the cancer is doing at the body. Next slide. And again, to put this in perspective, the degree of sensitivity of CT DNA compared to CT scans is equivalent, if not more, the jump from a chest X-ray to a CT scan. That's uh, the, the level of granularity that we're getting with this test. Next slide. So what is Signatera? Well, generally speaking, when we talk about CT DNA assays, there are two types, tumor uninformed or tumor informed. The tumor uninformed is basically a static panel that is uh, based on common mutations that we see in certain cancers. So for example, we can design a panel that's based on the top 20 mutations we see in colon cancer and apply it to everyone. The other part which Signatera is, is tumor informed. So what we do is we need tissue, whether it's from a biopsy or a surgical specimen. We do whole exome sequencing of the tumor and we also match it uh, with normal tissue West we get from the body code. And that we do that to eliminate any germline mutations or chip mutations, uh, which can increase false positive rates. So after we do the whole exome sequencing using Signatera's algorithm, we pick up to 16 clonal mutations and design a PCR specific for that patient. So it's not only tumor informed, it's also bespoke and personalized to each patient themselves. After that, it's just a 16 plex PCR uh, that you can uh, use for your patient moving forward. Uh, it's just a blood draw and you can get the results that'll tell you how much tumor, if there is tumor left in the body or not, and if there is, how much tumor is there. Next slide. So why do we think that being personalized and tumor informed is the way to go? Well, it really goes back to what do you need to have a usable and a precise MRD assay, which MRD stands for molecular residual disease or minimal residual disease is the other term. Well, for one, you need it to be ultra sensitive and ultra specific in detecting small traces of tumor DNA. Like I said, we're looking for a needle in a haystack here. So by targeting 16 variants, uh, as opposed to a wider panel of 50 or 100, we are able to go ultra deep in sequencing at more than 100,000 times NGS coverage. What that equates to is one genomic equivalent in 20 mLs of blood. Um, as I said, we eliminate germline and chip mutation, uh, so our rates of false, pos false positive are extremely low. On top of that, the way we report ctDNA with Signatera is MTM per mil, or mean tumor molecules per milliliter. Now, why is that important? Well, ctDNA or cell-free DNA in general is reported as VAT or variant allele frequency. Now, the problem with that is if you're checking uh, Mr. Smith's CT DNA today and a month from now, you can't compare the VAT at two time points because it's subject to background noise from the non-cancer part of the cell free DNA. So by reporting it as MTM per ML, you can actually uh, track it uh, the way you would with CEA, for example, and see if the CT DNA is going up or is responding to treatment. And last but not least, we only track clonal mutations. So we know that those will be sub, uh, propagated into the subclones, no matter how many times um, the, or how much tumor evolution that uh, cancer undergoes. Uh, so whether it's after one line of treatment or five, you if the cancer is coming back, you should still be able to detect it with this test. Next slide. And this is what the report would look like. So there are three components to it. In the top left corner, you get a quick uh, binary result, positive or negative, CTDNA is detected or not. 
Uh, then in the bottom, you get that table with the date and the MTM value. And the part that the patients love the most is the graph where they can easily follow it. And uh, of course, it's beautiful to see this graph where you see ctDNA is going down to undetectable and stays undetectable. Next slide. So broadly speaking, how can we apply this during a cancer uh, patient's journey? Well, in the near adjuvant setting, we can use it to uh, assess whether the patient is responding to the near adjuvant treatment before taking them to surgery. Then after surgery, can we detect minimal residual disease? And the idea is those are the patients who will benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Then during surveillance, uh, can we detect the cancer coming back way before it shows up on the scans. Again, to, to, to uh, uh, use an example of one centimeter on a CT scan, that's one billion cancer cells. Here, we are able to detect it at a much, much lower level. And then in the metastatic setting, can you use it to get a quick readout whether uh, the patient's systemic therapy uh, is working or not uh, ahead of the scans? Next slide. So moving into uh, Signatera data in colorectal cancer specifically, now we have published uh, previously in multiple um, peer-reviewed journals uh, showing the clinical utility of Signatera and also the prognostic value of Signatera. But what I want to focus on today is uh, a study that was just published in Nature uh, Medicine, next slide, uh, earlier this month, or I should say in January, um, where, um, oh, sorry, we got the slides mixed up. But, uh, so let's uh, backtrack a little bit and talk about the need in colorectal cancer. Specifically, I want to talk about stages two and three colorectal cancer, where we know that stage two, we cure eight out of 10 patients uh, with just surgery. We know that the absolute value of chemotherapy is about 5% at most. And there's about 15% who will recur regardless. Now, when we decide which patients to give adjuvant chemotherapy to, we use some uh, high-risk clinical pathological features, but we know that they're not great at prognosticating uh, who will respond and who will not. Uh, so we believe ctDNA can add value here. Next slide. And even within stage three CRC right now, the status quo is that everyone who is no positive receives adjuvant chemotherapy as long as they are medically fit. But uh, we know that even within stage three, there's a high variability where some of the lower risk stage three, they do just as well as stage two, if not better. And on the far end of the spectrum, we know that the high risk stage three are just short of stage four. Um, but the incremental value of chemotherapy is much higher there. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so this is the article that I just talking about. Uh, so this is part of Circulate Japan, next slide, uh, which is the largest ctDNA trial conducted so far, over 5,000 patients. And it's really three trials rolled into one. In the center part of the schema, you see uh, the GALAXY trial, which is the backbone of the Circle Japan study. Now, those, uh, it's a large-scale uh, large prospective registry trial, meaning patients are treated according to standard of care, but we do check Signatera one month after surgery, at three months, then every three months up to two years. Now, there are two interventional parts of the trial. The VEGA uh, trial is a de-escalation study for patients who are ctDNA negative at one month after surgery. They get randomized to adjuvant chemo versus observation. Then for patients who are positive, uh, they can go on the ALTER trial where everyone receives six months of adjuvant chemotherapy. Then they get randomized to observation uh, or uh, Trafluridin to Paracel. Now, Vega and Alter are still echoing patients, and we haven't had an interim analysis yet. But what was presented was uh, an interim analysis on over a thousand patients for the Galaxy study. Next slide. 
So this is the concert diagram. I will not go through it in details for the sake of time, but it's available uh, here for you to review. One thing I do want to point out that the pre-surgical detection rate of Sigmatera is about 96%, meaning when the cancer is still in the body, the test was positive 96% of the time, which gives us additional confidence in the test that when we know the cancer is there, it's detecting what it's supposed uh, to detect. Next slide. So taking a snapshot at all stages, uh, meaning stage one, all the way to oligometastatic stage four. When we looked at CT DNA at the MRD time point, which is um, defined as two to 12 weeks after surgery, ideally at the four week time point, what we found out is patients who are CT DNA negative, uh, they did way better than the patients who are CT DNA positive. Uh, meaning if your patient is Signatera positive after you, uh, they had their colectomy, they are 10 times as likely to recur than if they were negative. And if you look at the 18 month DFS here for the CTDNA negative arm it was 90% compared to just 38% for CTDNA positive. Now this, what you're seeing here is regardless whether or not they received adjuvant chemotherapy, this is a snapshot at all times. Uh, so it was great. As I said, we have shown the prognostic value of the test before, but it was good to see it in a larger scale uh, in a prospective trial. But one question that always remained is the so what, right? Uh, are you just telling me that my patient is going to recur regardless, or does adjuvant chemotherapy actually change uh, outcome? Next slide. Uh, well, when we did a multivariate analysis uh, compared to the traditional high-risk features, uh, you'll see that really ctDNA is the only uh, statistically significant or the most statistically significant uh, factor for prognosis. And as a distant second, you have BRAF, which makes sense. We know those patients are at high risk for recurrence. But it's important to know that all of the traditional high-risk clinical pathological risk factors were not statistically significant here. Next slide. So moving on to the predictive value of the test. So here we look at the high-risk stage two and stage three colon cancer patients who would be eligible for adjuvant chemotherapy. And we looked at only the patients who were MRD positive, and we stratified them by whether or not they received adjuvant chemotherapy. Well, what we saw is that if you're MRD positive, you will derive significant benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy with triple the survival at 18 month uh, disease-free survival. So patients who were MRD positive and received no adjuvant chemotherapy had an 18 month DFS of 22% compared to 61% for patients who received adjuvant chemotherapy. Next slide. And even when you break it down by each stage, high risk stage two, stage three, or oligometastatic stage four, you'll find out that the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy still holds true uh, for MRD positive patients with, again, significant hazard ratios across the board. Next slide. And when we did a multivariate analysis for recurrence in the MRD positive patients, adjuvant chemotherapy was the only statistically significant uh, variable that predicts for improved outcomes. Next slide. So that's great for the MRD positive, right? We've proven that adjuvant chemotherapy improves survival, but what about the MRD negative population? Can we still squeeze out a little bit of a survival benefit? Well, as you can see, the, the KM curves are almost completely superimposed. At 18 month, uh, the DFS benefit is about 3.5% and it's not even statistically significant. Uh, next. <clears throat> and this uh, graph that you're seeing here is from the SEER data. So one thing to keep in mind, yes, this is observational, not randomized, even though uh, we accounted for different high-risk uh, variables to try to minimize the bias. Uh, but looking at the natural history, 
of the different stages in terms of recurrence, you'll see that your high risk stage two and your stage threes by 18 months, a whole lot more had recurred compared to what we're seeing in this slide. So doesn't matter if you give your CT DNA negative patients chemo or you observe them, they have excellent outcomes uh, with 18 month BFS upwards of 90%. Next slide. And then we wanted to look at the dynamics, meaning does the change in CT DNA predict for response and long-term outcomes? So we compared the four week CT DNA time point to 12 weeks. So at that point, patient had received two to three cycles of KPOX. And we wanted to see, can we uh, predict early whether the adjuvant chemotherapy is working? And four patterns emerge. Patients who were negative and stayed negative, as you would expect, do extremely well. But interestingly, patients who were positive at four weeks and cleared by 12 weeks, they were not that far behind with 18 month BFS of 81%. And on the flip side of it, patients who were positive and stayed positive had really poor uh, 18 month uh, survival at 23%. But patients who were negative and turned positive we're not that far behind. So you see very distinct separations of the curves here. Now, what that tells us, and it has implications for practice, but more importantly, also for clinical trials is, can we, uh, can we early on tell whether adjuvant chemotherapy is working? And if it's not working, should we be trying something different? as opposed to exposing uh, the patients to the toxicity without the benefit. Next slide. And one other thing we looked at is the CT DNA clearance. So with adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, by the six month time point, 68% uh, or two thirds of the patients had cleared on adjuvant chemotherapy. And there was about 10% who cleared spontaneously. Uh, but then looking at the patients uh, who cleared on adjuvant chemotherapy compared to patients who did not clear, we see that clearance does correlate with long-term uh, outcomes. Next slide. And the last thing I wanna show you from this trial, which I'll preface it by saying these are very small numbers, but it's very thought-provoking. It's for oligomatostatic stage four. So uh, I, as I have shown on a previous slide, if you're oligometastatic stage four and MRD positive, you do benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. But when we split that population by whether they received near adjuvant chemotherapy or they went to uh, upfront surgery, we found out that patients who received near adjuvant chemotherapy and were still MRD positive did not benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Meaning if you gave them a treatment and it didn't clear their CT DNA, why would we think that throwing more of the same is going to work after surgery? As opposed to patients who had upfront surgery then went on adjuvant chemo, we see the nice separation of the curves on the right. Again, small numbers has to be validated in larger cohort, but uh, it was an interesting find because all of us um, in oligometastatic stage four, we always struggle uh, with the patients who re receive new adjuvant chemo, whether to give them adjuvant or just place them on observation. Next slide. So to summarize the finding of the GALAXY trial, uh, we've shown that post-surgical MRD status is predictive of chemotherapy benefit. If you're MRD positive, you benefit from chemo. If you're negative, no significant benefit. Uh, we further show that post-surgical MRD status is the most significant prognostic factor for recurrence. Uh, we showed that CT DNA dynamics are indicative of treatment response early on ahead of scans, and that clearance does correlate with improved DFS. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, we had an excellent pre-surgical detection rate of 96% across the board. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kanaki. Good morning, uh, my name is Hagen Genegi. I'm a medical oncologist uh, at the Providence Cancer Institute and Child's uh, Research Institute. And I'm gonna go over some cases, uh, next slide, um, to highlight uh, some aspects of, of the use of uh, Signatera in clinical practice. I know Barry mentioned earlier that 
we're going to have the signatory and immunotherapy in a subsequent session, but I'm going to give you a sneak peek of that um, uh, in, with the first two cases, and then we'll go over signatory in, uh, um, in early rectal cancer. So the first case is uh, the, uh, the setting is checkpoint inhibitors for DMMR colorectal cancer, uh, which uh, is a, a, a hot topic for sure. Um, we have seen in, in various uh, prospective and retrospective studies now that there is a, a high response rate uh, of, uh, with checkpoint inhibitors in advanced and in early stage DMMR colorectal cancer uh, over 80%. Uh, one clinical conundrum is uh, for patients that have a complete response uh, clinically to checkpoint inhibitor therapy, we don't yet know the optimal duration of therapy. And although uh, checkpoint inhibitors are generally well tolerated, uh, there are a proportion of patients that have toxicities, uh, and that ranges between 10 to 20%, depending on whether or not a PD-1 uh, directed therapy alone is used or in combination with CTLA-4. Um, so the first case is a 74-year-old woman uh, that uh, had a diagnosis of DMMR rectal cancer that I initially saw in August, uh, that uh, initially presented in August 2021. She presented uh, with a malignant obstruction of the uh, 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 left-sided colon. And she uh, unfortunately experienced a, a sigmoid perforation and required urgent resection. Interestingly, uh, because of this was still in the middle of COVID and there was very limited hospital beds, she actually had to be uh, sent up to Seattle at Swedish uh, Hospital, our partner hospital in uh, Seattle for resection. Uh, at that time, she had a diverting ostomy and an on-block resection and a pathologic T4B with cervix invasion N0, M0, DMMR rectal adenocarcinoma. When I read the surgical note, it did appear that the surgeon believed there could be some disease remaining deep in the pelvis. After, uh, after a, a, about a three-month uh, delay, the uh, patient presented to see me in Portland, Oregon, and uh, at that time, I decided to restage her, and uh, there was uh, some evidence of some uh, uh, pre sacral st stranding, and CEA was slightly elevated. I just decided early on that I wanted to use Signatera to uh, better understand this patient's uh, disease and whether or not there is residual disease, um, because uh, really, you know, this ha having been an urgent surgery, we really didn't know uh, indeed, you know, how much disease, if any, was left. And, and uh, sure enough, she did have a slightly positive Signatera uh, uh, MRD assay. Uh, I took her to the tumor board and because her tumor was at DMMR, we, uh, the recommendation was to offer her pembrolizumab on a Q3 weekly basis. I offered this and I, according to the schedule, we repeated the Signatera and already in February, after only two cycles of the pembrolizumab, the, while the CEA was still elevated, the Signatera became negative. We continued therapy and in March, 2022, after four doses of pembrolizumab, the patient was hospitalized with colitis and acute renal failure. It was actually interesting because she had an ostomy, as you might recall. And as we know, it's, it can be quite difficult to get a, a history of increased bowel movements, in, uh, particularly among patients with an ostomy. So there was a, a late diagnosis of colitis. It was, uh, and as a result of the severity, she had acute renal failure uh, due to the pre-renal uh, hit. We treated this successfully with uh, steroids. The patient was discharged. And then when I saw her again in June, uh, uh, we had another Signatera test and it continued to be negative. And the creatinine uh, thankfully recovered, uh, although the CT scan still showed the presacral stranding. After a lengthy discussion, we uh, decided not to restart the pembrolizumab and um, the uh, 
the CTD DNA signature assay has continued to remain negative. So I'll show some data that has supported that decision. Next slide, please. And this is a Canadian study uh, published by Dr. Bratman. At, at the study was done at Princess Margaret Hospital and published in 2020. And it was the INSPIRE trial where uh, 94 patients with a number of different solid tumors were treated with single agent pembrolizumab. And what they did is they measured at baseline the uh, Signatera, the circulating tumor DNA level, as well as documented tumor uh, burden. And uh, then they correlated resist response with CGDNA level. And they correlated that with progression-free and overall survival. So as you can see, it was a small-ish study, excuse me, but um, the, and there was a, a, a broader variety of uh, uh, different malignancies included. Next slide, please. And this was one of the remarkable findings, and which was that 100% of, uh, there was 100% overall survival among patients who experienced CTDNA clearance during treatment. And keep in mind, these are all patients that had advanced treatment refractory disease. And they did find that patients who achieved CTDNA clearance uh, and defined as be, becoming undetectable for at least uh, one on treatment time point had a 100% uh, overall survival, and that's the blue curve. They also looked at patients that remained below initial baseline, but were still detectable, they did less well. And those that had CTDNA increase above baseline uh, did quite poorly. So this data was quite helpful in our decision to defer further uh, therapy, which although was effective in, in our patient, uh, the, it was fairly toxic. And uh, I, I, we are currently following her course with circulating tumor DNA and episodic imaging only. Uh, next slide. Uh, next case uh, is the looks at the, the checkpoint inhibitors in patients with advanced uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the anus and anal canal. And we know that checkpoint inhibitors are approved as second line therapy in the United States for advanced disease. Uh, and the response rate is estimated between 11% uh, and 24% in prospective trials. One feature of squamous cell carcinoma is that in the absence of metastatic disease, when it is locally advanced, it can be quite difficult to measure. And we also know that immunotherapy in and of itself has uh, presents difficulties when it comes to measuring response due to uh, in inflammation that is immune related. So uh, this is a, a case scenario of a 59 year old male with a diagnosis of anal squamous cell carcinoma. And I met him initially in October, 2021, when he presented unfortunately with a large T4 tumor that was obstructing node positive clinically not metastatic uh, squamous cell carcinoma. He required a diversion ostomy. We looked at the tumor, it was P16 positive, and it was also TMB high. At Providence Cancer Institute, we have an in-house panel that we look at 450 genes and look at TMB status in all of our patients. Uh, in October, between October 2021 and June of 2022, we initially treated the patient with induction carbotaxel because his tumor was so large that it couldn't be incorporated into a standard radiation field. After induction therapy, which was complicated by infection, the patient proceeded to chemoradiation with capcitabine and mitomycin C. Unfortunately, he although he did have some palliation and, and, uh, and decreased pain, uh, he did require repeated tumor debridement, and, and on each time he had a tumor debridement, the surgeon went in and did a biopsy, and 
there was live squamous cell carcinoma tumor in, in, in place. Patient was quite symptomatic, ECOG2, he had lots of pain, and again, infections were uh, ongoing. So rather than rechallenge him with carbotaxol, which is a first line advanced regimen, we moved, uh, because of the issues with recurrent infection, we moved on to second line therapy with pembrolizumab, which is uh, an approved indication in advanced squamous cell carcinoma. Because I knew I would have a hard time looking at this fellow's tumor uh, radiographically, uh, having treated him for the past eight months, I really never knew whether it was progressing uh, because he always had he always had pain and he always had symptoms. And you know, when you looked at the CT scan, there was just this, you know, this mass in the perineal and pelvic area that was a thickened rind of tumor, and you didn't know where the inflammation and the infection started and the tumor ended. So I, at that time, decided that I needed to have a CT DNA assay to understand whether or not the next line of therapy is working. So I, in June of 2022, I ordered the Signatera at baseline prior to pembrolizumab therapy. We proceeded over the next two months with four cycles of pembrolizumab. A follow-up CT scan showed a, an inconclusive picture. There was a question about tumor progression versus increased edema of the tumor bed. The, the, there was some peritumoral lymph nodes, which may have been a little bit larger, which may point to progression versus reaction. Again, the patient having had a history of multiple pelvic infections. However, the CTDNA was rising slightly, as you can see in the third data point. And because the rise was uh, slight, we did give one more cycle and then repeated the Signatera uh, <clears throat> a month later, which uh, again showed a rising Signatera value. This allowed us to be sufficiently confident, actually, and to uh, make a call and discontinue the pembrolizumab so we can move on to another uh, successful therapy on a clinical trial. But I, I, it was actually um, an interesting scenario because in the meantime, the patient had gotten two opinions at other institutions and both uh, institutions recommended to continue uh, pembrolizumab-based therapy because of the known scenario of pseudoprogression in the in the setting of checkpoint inhibitor therapy. However, I do not believe that he had pseudoprogression. I think it was real and that Signatera supported that. So um, in the next, uh, next case. So, uh, so this is a, some further data that supported the decision from the Bratman study. And it really looked at the change in CTDNA at six weeks, so very early in the course of checkpoint inhibitor therapy, if indeed there is a decline, an increase in CTDNA level at as early as six weeks, patients have a very short progression-free survival and also a poor overall survival. And you can see that on the graphs on the left and right. And the patients with uh, an increasing CTDNA are, and that's the curve in green. Uh, next slide. So for those of you who know me, I, I'm uh, very passionate about treating uh, rectal cancer, particularly organ sparing therapy in uh, rectal cancer. And this is a, a case from a trial. Uh, it was a Canadian trial, excuse me, that was uh, recently published at last summer in JCO. And the trial was as follows. It took patients with early stage, now, um, uh, Adam presented a lot of data in stage two, three colorectal cancer. Well, this trial was predominantly stage one and very early stage two uh, rectal cancer, and including these patients and uh, treated them with um, induction chemotherapy for three months, followed by excision, and then followed by uh, therapy according to tumor response. So this particular case, he was 77, and I enrolled him in the study during my time 
in Seattle at Virginia Mason Medical Center. He had a T3B N0, low rectal tumor. CEA was 21, which in the old literature, if you look at it, it was a, always shown to be a poor prognostic factor in early rectal cancer, but there was no EMVI, uh, P, he was, tumor was PMMR, and he was eligible for the study. He successfully received four cycles of KFOX. Our colorectal surgeon proceeded after with a transanal excision, which is a full thickness excision of the tumor, but it's not harvest nodes. And his path stage was um, uh, a YPT2 R0 resection. So the, uh, uh, the tumor was well differentiated and the CEA had gone down. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So this was a conundrum for the patient because while they, uh, he did have a, a reasonable response to therapy, the uh, protocol recommended therapy was to a completion, a com excision of the tumor in a radical TME, which would require a permanent bag. And as a number of patients on this study have done, he decided that he did not want to have the radical surgery, did not want a permanent bag, and he elected a surveillance treatment alone. And for that reason, I, I thought, well, let's get as much information as we can and get a, a, a signatura level after the excision. So as you can see, the uh, CTDNA was negative and it uh, remained negative. Unfortunately, I only have a time course over three periods because um, shortly after that, I, I did leave Virginia Mason and I wasn't able to get um, further uh, data points. Uh, I, I do know that though that because he did enroll in our trial that we have data on, he has not subsequently relapsed. Uh, next slide. And this is a nice segue to our next speaker, maybe because this is some work that Dr. Laurie did. Um, and we did this together on uh, looking at patients that we collected uh, CTDNA prospectively on patients on the trial. And a couple notable things I wanted to point out, um, the, the sensitivity of uh, CTDNA in, in our study it really increased significantly as it in stage two versus stage one malignancy. So for this fella, he was a, a T3B and the success in that subgroup was a 73% sensitivity in detecting CTDNA before treatment began. So you heard a little earlier from uh, Dr. Jurdy, that the sensitivity of CDNA is in the high 90s for overall for stage two, three colorectal cancer. It is a little bit lower as the tumor, as we are earlier, uh, as we look at patients with er early tumor stages is, is one of the findings. And then if we look at the response of uh, CTDNA to induction therapy and correlate the CTDNA dynamics with the requirement for a subsequent TME, there was actually in the majority of patients, there was a good correlation with tumor downstaging and not requiring a TME. And then in the patients that had a residual TME in spite of uh, sorry, residual CTDNA in, in spite of induction chemotherapy, they uh, that point identified the patients that required radical surgery. There was one um, chip variant, and so uh, uh, likely germline variant that uh, that was seen, and that's the line in the blue. So uh, overall, I, I think I would point out uh, that you know in the earlier disease stage setting. And in the organ sparing setting, as we're trying to use CTDNA to decide about organ preservation, we are really still gathering that data and generating that data. And I think at this point, it's safe to say that that's still experimental, but hopefully we'll get a lot more information in the near future. Now, uh, I think Dr. Uh, Laurie is next. Uh, thank you for your attention. 
Great, and uh, thanks for the invite to be here today to uh, discuss the rollout of CTDA in Canada with Natera. Uh, next slide. So my case is a 62-year-old gentleman who had a resected stage three colon cancer, uh, completed four cycles of adjuvant KPOX in October of 2020, and a baseline scan post chemotherapy and CEA were both normal. Uh, so he was starting surveillance and we also started Signatera testing at the same time. Next slide. This is a CT scan that was done nine months after surgery and was about a year after his initial staging scan. Um, it showed that there was no evidence of disease and was reported as completely normal. Next slide. And CEA testing from before surgery as well as after adjuvant therapy and during surveillance was always normal uh, with our reference range being there in red. Next slide. However, at the same time as we had that surveillance CT scan that was showing as normal, what you see uh, at the nine months after surgery mark is that we had our first positive Signatera test with uh, MTM per mil of 3.75. We repeated it shortly thereafter, uh, about a month after, and showed that it was rising when we got this while we were uh, getting our next investigation set up. Next slide. So I, I think one question I'd love to get the panel's opinion and for those at home also thinking a little bit about, so now we've got a patient who's got, they've had their routine surveillance, what we suggest, CEA and CT scan, physical exam, those things are all normal and we have a rising CT DNA assay. So what would you do as your next step? So I'll give you a little bit, of, a couple seconds to think about that. And then I'll ask our, our panelists, Dr. Jerdy and Dr. Kenneke, what, what their usual approach is, and then we'll see what I did. Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Jerdy, what, what's kind of your recommendation to people usually about the next step? Yeah, look, we we don't have that much experience in terms of recommended, uh, you know, next assays for patients with CTDNA positivity. However, I think we're kind of taking a page out of the uh, the setting for elevation uh, elevation and CEA aren't we uh, and the, the practice that I've seen is, is to go to a, 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 a you know good cross sectional imaging uh, you know CT chest abdomen and pelvis uh, as well as a, a PET CT to investigate a, a, a positive CT DNA I will say that uh, that is not always uh, uh, a positive test, yeah, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, sounds good. Dr. Dirty, any, anything else? No, I agree. I mean, we're still learning about the space, but what I've seen, uh, what, what I've personally done in my clinic and just the feedback that I get from uh, other oncologists is first step would be maybe to uh, intensify surveillance with frequency. So instead of like the traditional waiting six months for another CT scan, maybe do it earlier in two to three months. And if that is still negative, that's when I usually uh, elevate it to either an MRI or a PET-CT. Uh, my preference is a little bit more towards MRI, just in terms of um, liver lesions and potentially some uh, lymph node detection. Um, but either is fine, and we were able to detect uh, oligometastatic lesions on both. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, I think the really important part here is we're still kind of learning what the best next test is, but it's a signal that we need to be more intense and do something. So I'll go to the next slide. So we ended up getting a, a PET scan as well as an MRI concurrently, and what you see on the image on the left is that there's a single oligometastatic um, liver metastasis present, um, and you can see it as well on the coronal sections on the right there. Next slide. Um, and you can also see the same abnormality on the MRI of the liver that we got. So we, we found this abnormality on the PET scan and got the MRI um, in kind of staging right before doing surgery to make sure that there was nothing else that needed to be resected. So this is a situation where routine surveillance would not have detected this recurrence in the liver. There was a, a standard CT chest abdo of pelvis two phase um, that didn't show anything. However, we found it on the, the pet in the liver. So, next slide. So the patient underwent surgical resection of that single liver metastasis um, and the post resection CT DNA is negative. Now we're 
uh, about 18, two years later, and we've had negative CT DNA and CT scans. I initially started following a little bit more closely with the, the CT scans because we had had this liver recurrence, and um, this is fantastic. So uh, this is a patient who's got disease that's found really early, small oligometastatic disease that was resectable because of the technology. Um, routine surveillance in Canada would be to do another CT scan about a year later um, after that that first one that was negative because there's there's nothing else that you know we didn't have an elevated CEA or anything like this. So I, I think in that one year span, so, you know, there probably would have been more progression. Either that lesion would have been larger, or there might have been more um, met metastases elsewhere. So I think the question is, would this have been resectable in a year? I, I don't know, but I, I'm certainly glad that we had this early signal that there was something there, and we were able to hopefully cure this patient of their recurrence. Next slide. So um, let me uh, come back in here before we go to uh, ending. We have a, a great opportunity for uh, some questions and to hear your responses to them. And uh, I have to first thank you all for really uh, a very interesting presentation, uh, Dr. Jordi taking some very complicated work and really making it very understandable. Even I understood it uh, quite clearly. And for a, a really uh, uh, thoughtful discussion, I thought, of uh, these various cases, really showing some real, um, actually challenging cases, Dr. Kennecke, uh, in which the uh, uh, test can be used. And with a very happy result uh, in the end, Dr. Lori, uh, in your particular case. I'm sure that um, uh, our viewers have a lot of questions, uh, as do I, but I'm going to hold back on mine for once and, and allow the audience to uh, ask some questions. So for further information on the Signatera test, uh, you can uh, go to natera.com, N-A-T-E-R-A.com forward slash Signatera, S-I-G-N-A-T-E-R-A hyphen C-R-C. And the test can be ordered through Life Labs in Canada. Additional information can be obtained at ask.genetics at lifelabs.com. Have that on the slide for you. And thank you all for attending today's webinar. I hope you found it of great interest and we look forward to seeing you at our second webinar coming uh, where we'll take a look at an in-depth look at the Signatera test and checkpoint inhibitors. So thank you all uh, for your questions and for your wonderful insights. And on behalf of Colorectal Cancer Canada, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for uh, a wonderful presentation and of course, Natera for their support in making this webinar possible. We look forward to taking your questions now. Please feel free to post them in the chat and uh, our panel will be pleased to answer them. Welcome back. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat and I do have a couple of my own. I do wanna start with one just to sort of um, make the, the setting. Uh, we know that the test can be used both in the adjuvant setting and in the surveillance setting. And maybe you could explain a little bit uh, how that works. Um, Dr. Jurdy, I guess you could start with that. And also, um, you know, is it used in conjunction with CEA? How exactly does it work in both the adjuvant and the surveillance setting? Thank you, Barry. Uh, great question. So in the adjuvant setting, or what we refer to as the MRD time point or post-surgical MRD time point, it's really used... Um, as a go no go test. So, in colorectal cancer patients who have a detectable uh, CT DNA uh, assay right after surgery, that tells us that those patients are at an extremely high um, chance of having recurrent disease. Basically, the test has a positive predictive value of 98%. So, virtually all patients without any additional therapy are destined to relapse. So when you're using it in the, uh, for adjuvant decision-making, that's, that's uh, the thinking. Now, post-adjuvant therapy, when you're using it in surveillance, it's really uh, to detect if the cancer is coming back when it's still at the molecular level, meaning before it becomes widespread or has multiple areas of metastases, and the best case scenario is where we're able to find one or two sites of metastases. So when it's still oligometastatic and go for cure based on that. 
Uh, now, as far as using it in conjunction with CEA, and we did uh, I did see a question in the um, chat also asking how it compares to CEA. So we have shown before that in terms of sensitivity and specificity, uh, it eclipses CEA significantly. Uh, whether it's stage two or stage three uh, baseline detection, or whether its ability to detect recurrence, it showed uh, way superior performance compared to CEA. Okay, um, thanks uh, for that. I think that, that makes that a little bit more clear. Um, here's one of the questions. How is an increase or decrease in CTDNA defined? Is it by tracking specific mutations or is it a general CTA, CTDNA concentration? I'm not sure who's best to answer that. I have a feeling it's you. <laughs> it's you yeah, I'll, I'll tackle that one. So um, the way the assay is designed, uh, we picked up to 16 variants to track. Uh, you need a minimum of two detectable variants to call, call a positive result. So when we calculate it, it's really the, uh, the, the MTM per ML is for each variant, but it's also averaged out, and that's what is reported. We don't report the, uh, the exact measurement for each of the 16 variants, but we do aggregate it and report it out as an average. So the next question for either Dr. Kaneki or Lori is, how can you be sure that the CT DNA, when, the, when you have clearance and it's negative after a period of time, how can you be sure that it's accurate and not just a false negative? Either, either one, just feel free to Yeah, sure, I, I can take a first crack at that one. I, I think that really gets back to the sensitivity of the assay and, you know, it, it, it no test is perfect for sure. So we do uh, still use uh, conventional cross-sectional imaging in addition to the ctDNA. Uh, so you know, if you look at the literature, the sensitivity and the eventual sensitivity, if you repeat the assay for a disease that's there is approximately 85%. And so variable in different studies, but that's that's really where it, it, it lands. So so it's not it's not 100%. So that's important to keep in mind. And then again, uh, you know, you you do want to continue to do the the standard cross sectional imaging. I'll make one more comment about the CEA because that was a really interesting question. And you know, so one of the things that has come up is, do you still need to do the CEA if you do the CTDNA? And and you know, I think technically the guidelines still recommend the CEA. You know, sometimes you know that certainly requires you know another blood draw for the patients, and for patients that you know haven't had a preoperative elevated CEA, um, if I follow them with a CTDNA assay, then I generally don't do the uh, CEA postoperatively. So that's been my practice. So one of the other questions, uh, uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy. One of the other questions is um, the only benefit, the way this is put, so maybe have to explain a little bit. The only benefit that I see in doing CTDNA is it prevents multiple CT scans and MRI. However, are there any benefits in terms of prognosis, life expectancy? So a little bit, a little bit hard to understand. I guess the question is whether or not it, it may avoid the use of some scanning. But again, as you said, we use those scans to confirm the results to make sure uh, that there is uh, either a true negative and, and and not a false negative, by way of example. But does it really make a difference in terms of the prognosis of the patient? That's a great question. I think. One of the things that's hard sometimes with technology, when we have a new technology, is parsing out kind of the, the magnitude of improvement of, of what it means. And I would say in, in the real world setting, getting a CT DNA test does not change the amount of imaging. If anything, there's probably more imaging for patients. So I don't think it actually results in less imaging at this time point. I think the dream long term is that CT DNA gets to a point where we can say, you know, instead of doing a CT scan year one, year two, year three, we can have more CT DNA testing and only do CT scans if we really need it. And I think that's a, a really good long-term goal. That, that's kind of the vision. And, and then those radiology resources can be better deployed somewhere else. And, and this new technology might be able to, to do something to make us more efficient and better with our testing. 
Mm -hmm. um, from a prognostic perspective, you know, we, we have had the dynamic study come out, which shows that in stage two colon cancer by using ctDNA as a landmark analysis, so after the surgery, you're able to better figure out the risk of someone's cancer coming back. And by using less chemotherapy, you actually have the same outcome because you, you have more information to make the decision and to discuss chemotherapy. So when someone comes and sees us to talk about adjuvant chemotherapy, the amount of chemo or what we're recommending really depends on risk. And so this is a tool to help us. Um, and so it's not just, you know, about the prognosis, but it's also about living well with cancer. And so if we're able to reduce the intensity of treatment for some patients, I think that's really important as well. So in some cases, might you decide to go to either three months versus six months of treatment? Is that it or none at all in some cases? Yeah, so in, in dynamic, it was basically no chemotherapy for stage two. We're going to have the results of dynamic three, hopefully is kind of the next prospective study that's in stage three. Um, and then we've got Circulate US, which I'll put in a plug, that's going to be opening up in Canada in the next couple of months as well. Um, so there's going to be a lot of prospective data showing um, really how much impact we have on survival. And we're still generating lots of data here, but the, the data to date is really exciting. You know, if ctDNA is detected, the chance of a cancer coming back is extremely high and we need to do something there. And if it's negative, we know that there's a lower risk and we have a lot of toxicities from our treatments. So we can hopefully help personalize treatments with this information. I, I'm conscious of the time. So I'm going to just ask two quick questions. Uh, hopefully the answers will be quick too, <laughs> or not too long, uh, just to, to, so that everybody can get their, get their dinner in time. Does the uh, Signatera patient report capture any other actionable mutations? It's no, open to anybody. Yeah, it's not designed to look for actionable mutations. Uh, we don't track driver mutations, which are uh, the actionable mutations, um, not mutually exclusive, but uh, we, we, because the idea is if you're tracking the actionable mutation or a driver mutation, that clone might die off with a specific treatment and you have clonal evolution and then new clone arises and you would miss it if you're just tracking the driver mutations. And I'll, I'll just close with one thing. Where can, uh, or how do we access the test in Canada? I, I believe it's through Life Labs and you have the, the link on the, on a previous slide. But maybe you could just uh, inform um, our healthcare professionals how that is going to be done um, so that patients can benefit it if they want. And I do understand that it is self-pay. How can we uh, find out the cost of it? And uh, I guess that would be for uh, Dr. Jervy. Okay, that's coming to me. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that exact cost actually for life labs. Uh, I can tell you the way it works. Uh, I mean, if you follow the link, it'll kind of walk you through it. But uh, basically, the first step is really just filling out, discussing it with your patient, filling out the form, and sending it off. Usually, our team will, uh, or in this case, it'll be life lab will work at uh, tissue acquisition. So it wouldn't be your responsibility to send the tissue um, and just a, two tubes of blood for the first test and um, one tube on any subsequent time point. I, I do understand that the test is um, available, as I said, through Life Labs. I believe uh, the you can obtain the cost by writing a ask genetics at lifelabs.com and that's ask.genetics at lifelabs.com and certainly you can see further information on the Natera site at Natera n-a-t-e-r-a dot com forward slash signatera hyphen crc so that's s-i-g-n-a-t-e-r-a hyphen crc and you can get additional information there. So I want to thank you all, Dr. Jerdy, uh, Kennedy, and Lore, for your fantastic input today. We're going to have a follow-up uh, session coming in another few weeks. So those who are interested in the perspective from uh, furthermore <laughs> than what you've already talked about, Dr. Kennedy, on immunotherapy and some further uh, information uh, will be available in this upcoming uh, webinar. Thank you all for attending today's webinar. I hope you found it of interest and uh, look forward to our uh, messaging on our second upcoming webinar uh, with Natera. 
Thank you so much to Natera for your sponsorship and making this a possible today so that not only our healthcare professionals can benefit from it, but our patients can be better informed as to the next steps uh, in their treatment. Thank you. And have Thanks a good very day. much for the invitation. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.